Um, we would uh, like to thank you all for being here and thank the gods of electricity uh, for allowing me to see you and to uh, bring these two great authors uh, here tonight to the museum. Um, and uh, we're really, really excited to not only uh, present authors as we do uh, regularly, but also people who um, have written biographies about two um, people that Twain was very close with, Thomas Edison and Nikola Tesla. Uh, and we're also particularly excited to um, uh, be welcoming folks from the Thomas Edison National Historic Park. Na is that right? Historic? National Historic Park. Uh, if you guys want to stand so everyone can see who came all the way up from Jersey. And he's got a beautiful home down there. So if you guys have not been to Thomas Edison's home laboratory down in New Jersey, please. Uh, what's the website? That's why you don't ask curators, you ask more about people. Um, <laughs> what was that? NPS.gov slash EDIS. Okay, so nationalparkservice.gov, NPS.gov forward slash EDIS. All right, I'm sure you're all going to go visit, correct? <laughs> okay, excellent. Um, a few things before we get started. A, I want to make sure you take your uh, cell phones, and we know that, that Edison Tech Club helped us have these wonderful light devices. We're going to turn them off and forget about them for uh, the next hour and 15 or so. Um, and as we, uh, as we welcome our special guest first, uh, I want to introduce tonight's moderator, who is our, uh, our uh, education program manager here at the Mark Twain House Museum, Mr. Craig Hotchkiss. Now, uh, we were really, really fortunate uh, that there's not one but two terrific uh, biographies that are out on the shelves right now, uh, in particular out on our shelves right now in our gift shop. Uh, so after this program, both of these authors will be signing um, copies of their books. Uh, and I know that they're getting close to running, <coughs> so you're going to have to elbow and shove and push people out of your way. Um, this first book uh, and first author uh, is on Nikola Tesla, inventor of the electrical age. Um, oh, Tesla fan down front? Okay. We're not choosing sides tonight. <laughs> w. Bernard Carlson is professor of science, technology, and society in the School of Engineering and Applied Science and professor of history at the University of Virginia. His books include Technology and World History and Innovation as a Social Process uh, Elihu, Elihu, uh, I'm terrible tonight, I'm sorry. Elihu Thompson and the Rise of General Electric, 1870 to 1900. We could scarcely ask for a better person to talk about Nikola Tesla tonight. Please welcome Bernie Carlson. And this gorgeous book, Edison and the Rise of Innovation, um, uh, is uh, not only a wonderful history of Edison, but it's got uh, beautiful, beautiful photos uh, and and um, renderings and etchings and what have you. And it's uh, it's by this individual, Leonard de Graff, uh, who's an archivist at Thomas Edison National Historical Park. Before joining the National Park Service in 1991, he was on the staff of the Thomas A. Edison Papers. De Graff is the author of Historic Photos of Thomas Edison, and his articles have appeared in the New York Daily News, Seaport Magazine, and Business History Review. Please welcome Lenny DeGraff. And make sure your mics are on, gentlemen. There we go. And you're off. And my, yes, mine's on. Well, thank you very much, and uh, welcome, gentlemen. I, I thought that I would uh, start uh, the discussion tonight um, having read both books, and uh, they of course being on gentlemen who were uh, in the same realm of interest, uh, there was a quote in your book, Bernie, uh, from Thomas Hughes, um, a great historian of American technology, made the point that inventors were like artists, uh, and they, they evolved their own style of invention. And I think that would be a great way to, to start, is if each of you could talk about uh, uh, Edison and Tesla in terms of what their style of invention was and how they came to that, particularly the influences on them in their youth, 
to uh, bring them to the manner, the way in which they approached invention. So did we, uh, did we toss a coin? <laughs> no, we didn't. Uh, Are you sure you want to do that? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Brian. Thank you. So uh, full, uh, full disclosure in advertising, Tom Hughes was my dissertation advisor. Been strongly influenced by the um, by Professor Hughes's ideas, and in fact, I got into this business of writing about, um, as I often say, dead white inventors. Uh, as a result of uh, of Tom, and uh, I spent most of my career uh, writing and investigating how how inventors do what they do, how they have a style, how they have a method. And first off, let me say that the notion that they have a method is is in kind of uh, a counter position to taking the, the, the argument that an inventor, whether it be Edison or Tesla or the Wright brothers, are simply geniuses, that somehow this magically they, they do amazing things. I mean, the inventors have, they have a strategy. They get up in the morning, they have a cup of coffee, they go to the laboratory, and they start doing stuff in some intentional, purposeful way. Uh, if I was going to tell you one or two things about uh, Tesla's style of invention, I think the major thing that I would say is, 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 is he was a thinking rather than a tinkering inventor. That is to say that he did his best work in his mind in, in, sort of a, in an abstract sort of sense. And that he, that's a direct contrast to sort of Edison, who was much more of a tinkering individual. Now, they both have a bit of tinkering, a bit of thinking, but Tesla's on the thinking side of the, the spectrum. Tesla comes to that, Craig, um, as a result of uh, as having an interest in childhood. In his, his childhood, uh, any number of things happened, but in particular, uh, his family lost an, uh, the, the first son, Tesla's, uh, Tesla's older brother, and this really threw the family into, into, into emotional disarray. And the young Tesla, at about 10 or 11, had just terrible nightmares and visions as a result of this. Um, but rather than being overwhelmed by those visions, as a, as a youngster, he read a novel, and he decided that he was going to, based on what the, happened in this novel, he was going to develop his willpower, and instead of being overwhelmed by these nightmares and these visions, he was going to take control of them and direct them in, in productive ways, so that he would, as a little kid, would go on exciting journeys and adventures and fantasies, and he flew, he went to strange and exotic cities and all of this. And that was really the kernel of the developing this style of invention that he could visualize things in his mind's eye. And he insisted that he saw everything, if you will, about arm's length in sort of a cube out there that was, say, you know, one foot, you know, one foot, one foot by one foot by one foot, and there he could actually run machines and imagine how they were working and whether the parts were, were wearing down or the circuits were being completed and all of that. And indeed, cognitive psychologists talk about that that approach or that 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 sort of memory as being an eidetic memory. So the key thing I'd say about Tesla as to start us off here tonight is, is Tesla was a thinker and he was a high, he had a strong sense of visualization. And that really came out of his childhood. But Lenny will, you know, either chime in and compare. He's going to do the compare and contrast now. I am. <laughs> yeah, this is Sesame Street. You know, which 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 things belong together, which things belong apart. All right. Well, I'm going to throw out just a couple of thoughts to get us started. I was thinking about Thomas Edison. Um, is it on? No. You got a green light. That's what on and off means. Can you hear me now? <laughs> a couple, couple things. I mean, we're going to get into both Edison and Tesla throughout the evening, so I um, won't go into too much detail But uh, at this point. But I think a couple things you need to keep in mind about Tom Edison in terms of why he's important in the history of American innovation and technology, and that he's um, one of the first significant inventors that turns innovation into a business. Um, and spends his whole life um, creating these laboratories, these spaces that are designed to um, take an idea and turn it into a, a tangible product, and then figure out ways of manufacturing and marketing them. Um, he's not always successful, um, but he's successful enough that he's able to do that for a very long time, because he lives into his 80s. Um, he also spends a lot of time, and you talk about style, um, the thing that comes to mind is that he spends a lot of time thinking about the process of innovation and, and invention. And 
when I say process, I don't mean that he actually sits down and writes down a list of the steps that you need to take in order to um, create a new invention, but he spends a lot of time thinking about how to create these laboratories, how to create these productive spaces, and to motivate his workers and to, and, and to be as creative as possible. Um, we learn that from not just from one document, but from all the you know, combined evidence that we have that has survived the collections that I work with and, and my colleagues work with um, that help us understand Edison. So that's the, the, the important thing that I would think about in terms of Edison's style. Well, for both these, what do you want? <laughs> it should be like Phil Donahue. <laughs> Technical difficulties. Uh, for both these men, uh, the development of uh, laboratories was important to their work. Although I think there's some distinctions between the two of them in terms of how they used laboratory, how they related to a laboratory. Uh, so if you could if you could touch on that a little bit, um, I, you you mentioned a little already, Lenny. If you could expand a little bit on uh, you know Menlo Park, West Orange, and how that evolves as a mechanism for the development of his inventions. Yeah, the the, the laboratories are important. They're physical spaces. Um, that Edison can control, which is very important uh, because he can manage his own, his, his own work environment. There are also spaces where he brings together all of the different resources that he needs for him to be successful. Um, that includes the latest tools and equipment, the, mo the most up-to-date and, and advanced equipment that he can find, the most advanced scientific and technical information, both Menlo Park and West Orange had uh, very important research libra libraries within the laboratory itself. Um, and uh, he brings also into, the, into these laboratory environments talented collaborators, people with a, a, a broad range of skills and, and knowledge and abilities that um, he's able to kind of bring together and work together as a team. Um, the other thing that is important about the Edison Laboratories is that they, because they're associated with Edison, and, and we're going to talk about this more, I'm, I'm pretty sure, about the persona or the, or the reputation of Edison, of his, of his celebrity and fame, um, he creates this uh, uh, reputation as a reliable technologist, as somebody who has the capability of solving technical problems um, and creating businesses that, 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 that can succeed, um, he inspires the confidence of investors. And that's very important in terms of changing the dynamic of innovation in the late 19th century. Now investors can feel comfortable supporting an inventor with a laboratory like you know, that, 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 that Thomas Edison um, and, operates. Um, so what he does with these laboratories is to change the, the relationship between the inventor and the, and the corporate investor and um, also makes innovation a less risky enterprise. And is, uh, Tesla, how does Tesla, uh, in relation to that, how does his uh, method? Uh, so one of the uh, things that I spent a lot of time working on in the 1990s is a, a big comparative study of, of uh, Edison, Alexander Graham Bell, and Elisha Gray on the development of the telephone. And one of the takeaways there is we spent an enormous amount of time studying sketches from the Edison notebooks of, uh, of several colleagues of mine and some engineering students. And the, t and the insight was is, is, is the real invention activities where the creative sparks flew in Edison's laboratory was always in between Edison and a number of other people. That we, you'd have sketches that would survive, and there would be clearly the pencil would be handed from person to person as they were discussing how to develop this, test, this telephone. Should we do the circuit this way? 
can we arrange the parts that way? And, and there would be, you could eventually see that there were different, hand, you know, people writing notes in different ways and all of that. So for Edison, the, the creative process in the laboratory was all about having those right people together to play almost a game of basketball, tossing the, uh, tossing the ideas, tossing the ball back and forth. By contrast, Tesla, again, because he's a primarily a theoretical inventor, a thinking inventor, does his work in relatively solitary environments. So as a result, his, his several laboratories that he has in New York City, he has no more than maybe at most four or five machinists who basically take direct instructions from Tesla. There's no collaboration, there's no, well, Mr. Tesla, did you ever think about doing it this way as opposed to that way? You always would do it the Tesla way. <laughs> no, I'm just debating first. And indeed, the, the notebook records that we have are, are, are not this interesting mix of, of personalities and different kinds of entries, but they are Tesla's systematic entries and notes. So his, his laboratories were much smaller, and people at the time uh, were aware. They often had newspaper stories, and they'd say, consult the two wizards. And by that, they meant that they had asked Ed Edison's opinion about whatever was the topic of the day, and they'd asked Tesla. And in those newspaper stories, people noticed that T Edison indeed had at West Orange the, a, a, a true invention factory, quite a huge operation. It looked a lot like the modern R&D lab, whereas Tesla had a very small, very personal operation that, in fact, you probably would even say it looks like an art studio or a poet's garret. You know, you've got a, you've got a I think I, I'm back on. Oh, you're back on. Yeah, I'm back on. Um, well, in, it, Lenny brought up uh, the, the development of confidence of the investor as a consequence of what they can, what they can see and what's demonstrated. How did that work for Tesla? Did it work? His his uh, research research project. <laughs> so, one of the points that I make in the book uh, is is this is that we tend to write about up to now in in history famous inventors for whom there are companies named. So it's not surprising that there have been lots of lots of books over the years about Edison because there's McGraw Edison, there's, there's Consolidated Edison, there's California Edison or Marconi, you go to England, there's Marconi Cable and Wireless, and until the recent arrival of the Tesla Motor Car Company, there were no companies named after Tesla. And that has led that tendency to write about, you know, companies that had famous founders, Western, for example, in that we have worried, we tended to fall into an assumption that the way inventors made money was by men. <laughs> I, I mean, I knew I had a strong voice. Now, that's, that was really pretty impressive. Okay. Uh, we assume that people made money, or inventors made money, by manufacturing, by basically getting involved in the development and, and marketing, manu development, manufacturing, and marketing of new products. Tesla took a very different approach, his business strategy, and he did have a business strategy. Lots of people say, oh, he was just this flighty visionary, and he did, you know, he had no interest in business and making money. He was just, he was here for the purity of the ideas, please. You know, I take a slightly different view. I don't mean to offend anybody, but I take a little different view. Edison's notion was that you, or excuse me, Edison, not, I meant Tesla. Tesla's business view was, is as you invent, you, excuse me, you patent, you promote, and you sell the patents. In other words, it was an IP strategy. So he gave credibility by elaborate demonstrations, by giving really big interviews, and by exciting people that they thought that whatever Tesla was working on was really going to be the next big thing. And so the way, the path for him to reputation was to be connected to big ideas and culture and to, and to be sort of the, uh, it would be indeed this, this sort of harbinger of the brave new world. Very different strategy than Edison, who preferred, as, as, as Lenny has often pointed out, to be, you know, not really necessarily be in the limelight the way that Tesla did. Tesla was, Tesla was, um, you know, was, was clearly a publicity hound. There's, there's no two ways about that. He enjoyed being in the limelight, he enjoyed being interviewed by newspaper reporters. And Edison, Edison had a very different view about, about a, or a very different relationship with the press. And maybe Lenny wants to talk about that. Yeah, yeah I, I think he, he has a more ambivalent relationship to, to the media. I mean, what Edison is doing, and he does start, starts to do this early on in his career, is he begins to use the media 
um, and he's helping to create the technologies that, that usher in these new media uh, throughout the late 19th century. So he's very much in tune with what's going on. Um, but he's using the media to sort of create um, this persona of what I call in the book, in the beginning of the book, you'll, 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 you'll read where I talk about the two, basically the two sides of Edison, where there, one is the wizard personality, and the other is what I call the innovator. Because in the book, I wanted to remind readers that when you're talking about Thomas Edison, you're not just talking about an inventor, but you're talking about an innovator who's involved in a broad range of, of activities. Um, and the, the, the opening chapter in the book talks about this, uh, what, I thought, what I thought was a very funny account written by this man named Maurice Holland. And I don't know if any of you ever heard of Maurice Holland. Oh, yes, yes, he actually uh, was a, probably the one sociologist that interviewed Edison in the 1920s. Right, 1927, he, he visits the Edison Laboratory uh, in West Orange to, um, as he puts in his report, to figure out what makes Edison tick. Um, and I'm reading this account of, of, this, of, this, of this visit, uh, Holland at the beginning, and Holland, by the way, is very important in, in the history of innovation because he's the guy that kind of lays out this, this linear model of innovation. So he, he, he's not well known, but he's important for, for, pe for people who are interested in the history of understanding innovation. Um, so if there's anybody that's going to get, Ed, get Ed, coax out of Edison, you know, how, how you approach invention or innovation, it's Maurice Holland. Um, he gives himself five days, and he tells us that in his report. He, he, he eventually winds up going to West Orange, um, is led through the laboratory by somebody who I assume is the Secretary of Medicaw, eventually is introduced to Edison and tells Edison um, you know, what he's doing here. And he said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm here for five days you know, to, to, stu to study your process, your method. And, uh, you know, Edison said, well, you can stay as long as you want, but you don't need that much time because there's no process and there's no method. <laughs> <laughs> so Holland, and Holland continues to write. Now I'm reading this. I'm, I, I'm reading this at the beginning of writing this book when I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to approach the story of, of Thomas Edison. And, and Holland asks, well, Mr. Edison, you know, he's just trying to break the, the ice in a conversation. He said, well, how many inventions do you have going on here? And Holland reports that Edison says, well, I have no idea, but I have enough ideas to break the Bank of England. <laughs> now, in the archives, we have 3,500 laboratory, standard-sized laboratory notebooks and about 800 pocket notebooks that contain, if not daily, close to daily records of, of Edison's experimental records. So, you know, we you know, can see where this is going. And Holland goes on to kind of describe the laboratory as this ramshackle laboratory that, you know, was unplanned. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason why things are going on. And, you know, Edison has no idea. There's no cost accounting apparatus. I happen to know that we have hundreds of linear feet of financial vouchers and accounting records. So I'm beginning to see, it's clear to me that something's going on here. Edison is sort of, and I don't know why, I, 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 I could speculate um, if you want, but Edison is sort of kind of playing to Holland the wizard persona, the wizard person personality, which is often the, the personality that the public gets to see when you read interviews with Edison or you read accounts of him in the media. When I read that, I thought, you know, he, he's, he's, Edison is he's crazy. He knows exactly what's going on in the laboratory, and he knows every penny that's being spent, and you know he's keeping track of everything. There is method to his madness, and so that's how I approach the book. It, and, and it occurred to me that um, it's possible that Edison was kind of um, portraying himself the way he thought Holland wanted him to be portrayed. It's like, okay, here's a guy who you know is probably just another reporter, or whatever. Um, I'm gonna, you know, play the, you know, the jocular wizard of Menlo Park, and Holland is the one guy that you actually want to talk to and say, okay, you know, give me the straight story about what you're doing here. Two sides of a very complex personality. It was my first inkling that when you talk about Thomas Edison, you're not talking about this one, one-dimensional figure, but you're talking about somebody that 
is a lot more complex. It's interesting, we're here at the Mark Twain house, and of course Mark Twain is a pen name. Um, and he's a man very much um, uh, who used and enjoyed celebrity and persona, and uh, Bernie, you said just a moment ago that that's something that Tesla enjoyed as well. Could you just talk a little bit more about Tesla, the persona, as opposed to the, the, the real man? So, in, in the, as, as Lenny's been suggesting, some of the, the dynamics of, of his book, you know, when you write a biography of, a, of an inventor, you're, you're trying to take a measure of the man and you're trying to create, in words, a portrait. A painter, a painter or an artist use paint. And, and creates a picture, you know, in two dimensions, and uh, you know, in you know, in, in you know, we kill dead trees and fill them with hundreds, hundreds of thousands of works, tens of thousands of works. Um, but you know, the what Tesla really enjoyed doing was, or Tesla really believed, is is, 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 is that he was to, in order to succeed, he was going to have to engage people's imaginations. His approach to invention, and what I emphasize in the book, is. Is his first and foremost. He, he sincerely believed. Came out of his his, his, his child again. His, his the religious upbringing that he had in the Serbian Orthodox Church uh, was that you underlying every great invention there was an ideal, a principle that had been put there by God, the logos, and you had to pull that logos, that idea out, and, and bring it forward and get rid of all the extraneous stuff that might be preventing you from coming up with a really good invention. So that was. Well, on one hand, what Tesla did, but then he realized that the average Yahoo, the average individual, wasn't going to appreciate that that wonderful idea, that wonderful ideal, and so he had to tell stories. He had to engage their imagination so he could see the potential of that of that great idea. So, on one hand, it wasn't just that he, you know, he he craved the attention. He he, he certainly enjoyed the attention, but he realized that he had to weave together his his. He had to weave together stories and values and metaphors out there from the larger culture to um, basically advance his inventions and get the financial support he wanted. And that, I think, is why Tesla had actually a fairly, a fairly good friendship with Mark Twain. They, they belonged to the same, the same club in New York City on Gramercy Park, the players. Uh, Tesla and, and uh, Twain became friendly at some time probably in the, in the early 1890s. We know from Twain's journal that is, as early as 1888, uh, Tesla has gotten on to Twain's uh, sort of radar because uh, part of the page compositor was to use an electric motor. The electric motor wasn't working very well. Um, Twain had actually given extra money to Page to perfect the electric motor for the, uh, for the typesetting machine. Um, and then Twain looked in the newspapers and suddenly realized that Page had one more time been scooped by Tesla, who had a really successful motor. And so Twain and Tesla had an interesting relationship. And so it started there, but I think what grew between them was this constant discussion of what's, what's happening in American society, what's happening in the culture, what is the news of the day, what are the, what are the important issues, and how can technology be used to shape that particular culture. Both men, Twain and Tesla, were very much interested in that. I think, could you speak a little bit about what uh, Twain's relationship was with Edison? I, yeah, I, I, sure. Um, I, I think what draws Twain to Edison is something that I see a lot in the late 19th century, and that is uh, technological enthusiasm. Um, there's an enormous, uh, on the part of the public, there's an enormous amount of interest in what Tesla's doing, what Edison's doing. What, I mean, this is why reporters are going to these laboratories you know, all the time to get these stories, because readers want to know, readers want to read about that. They're fascinated with these new technologies. That's why the, the um, international expositions that you see uh, in the last you know, two or three decades of the late 19th century are so popular, uh, the Chicago exposition. Um, several Paris expeditions. I mean, these draw thousands of people. So people are interested in this. Um, so I think that's what part of what's drawing Twain to Edison that, you know, Edison comes to symbolize this, you know, our technological future. Um, the other thing that I think that may have attracted them is that they're both from the Midwest. Um, even though they are, they're not exactly contemporaries, Twain is a little bit older. Um, they come from the same sort of, in the American Midwest, the same social, cultural 
kind of background. So I think they were able to kind of talk to each other. Um, their relationship is, is just as um, fleeting as it was with uh, Tesla. Quaint uh, came to West Orange in 1888, uh, primarily because he was interested in learning more about Edison's uh, phonograph, which Edison was just about to um, try and perfect and develop into a commercial product. The idea that Edison was pursuing at the time was as a office business uh, dictating machine. And that was something that appealed to Twain because, you know, you can imagine how much more you could write and publish if you just like speak into a machine, have to send, have the words recorded and then, you know, have somebody type them later on. Uh, it would have made it that much more productive. Uh, the only account we have of this visit is marginalia on a letter that uh, Somebody wrote to Edison many, many years after 1914, where he asked Edison about, about his relationship with Twain. And Edison talks about Twain coming to the laboratory and says that Twain spent many hours in, the li in a library in West Orange um, swapping funny stories uh, with, with Edison and I guess whoever uh, Twain brought with him and recording them on the phonograph. And, Sadly, uh, the last note is that Edison wrote that these cylinders were lost in my big fire. Now, what he means by his big fire is a, uh, a, a huge fire that destroyed a big part of his factory in West Orange in December of 1914. Um, so that's, unless he was mistaken and they were not lost and they may turn up someday, um, you know, we, we will never know what's on those cylinders. Antiques Roadshow. <laughs> um, we be all out there looking for it. <laughs> but I think that, I just want to add to that, um, that, you know, I think that um, this technological enthusiasm that I, that I mentioned that, that, kind of, that Edison kind of taps into um, is there's, there's this sense, Herbert Crowley talks about this in his book, The Promise of American Life, around 1910, um, that there's a sense in America that life is going to continue to get better. Um, and technology is part of that. And that's, I think that's what motivates Edison. I don't think that he's pursuing you know, necessarily an ideal that Tesla is doing. I think what he's trying to offer people are practical technologies that are going to help make life better for people. We should probably spend uh, a minute or two talking about the DCAC uh, controversy uh, between these two gentlemen. I, I know because we spoke beforehand, uh, probably want to address some of the myths of that argument um, and what it meant in terms of the work of each of these inventors. Uh, because I think uh, DC went first. Your breath there, you just uh, you're very fine. Uh, I was going to look at my watch and say, "Oh, we're out of time." <laughs> <laughs> the main event. We're not out of time. That's right. Yeah. And now in this corner, <laughs> representing. Well, I don't. I don't know. I don't know where to begin. I I, I I have to confess to you that part of me is um, fascinated by, you know. When I say contemporary, I mean in our own. I think you might make up. Oh, in our own time. I'm fascinated by contemporary discussions, particularly on the internet, about this whole rivalry between Edison and Tesla. Um, fascinated, but also kind of befuddled about how to address it, because what I see and read uh, is just chock full of mythology and, and misinformation and, you know, events that happen many years apart that are just kind of conflated in an unfortunate ways. And um, I have mixed feelings about it because not, on the one hand I think it's a good thing because it gets people to talk about these things that Bernie and I study all the time. Um, and we, we want that. Um, but also kind of facing the difficulty of how, you know, how you kind of correct that mythology. Um, one, other, one last point and then I'll let Bernie talk a little bit. Because um, I know you're just want to jump right in there. Um, this idea that Edison and Tesla were mortal enemies is just not true. Uh, look, can I, I don't know if we'll dispel this myth tonight, but there's just no evidence that there was this enormous rivalry. Um, so let me speak to that before we even get to the ACDC controversy. <laughs> okay, so in, in the mid-1890s, about 1893, excuse me, um, Tesla gets in the mail a sort of postcard-sized postcard um, photograph 
of Edison. It's called the Carte de Visite, the Carte de Visite. and Tess, and Edison has indeed actually autographed it. You know, to to Mr. You know, to Nikola Tesla. Best wishes, Thomas A. Edison. And we know about this because Tesla writes home to his family in Serbia, and he says. I must be getting somewhere. I got a postcard. I mean, I got a signed picture from Edison himself. And if that's not enough, in 1904, 1905, there is a meeting of the electrical engineers in New York City, and Tesla's giving a demonstration, and the demonstration doesn't go so well. But Edison slips in the back, and Edison never goes to these, these sort of public engineering meetings. And Tesla leaves the audience gets them on their feet to applaud that the great man, Edison, is there. Now, these guys are arch enemies, mortal rivals, <laughs> like you see in the, the, you know, the Tesla Edison rap video on, the, on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't know what I'm going to do with these back toys. So, okay? So, you know, but those are, those are two, two points that I always come back to when I think about this. So the ACDC controversy, you know, in, in a certain sense is, is an interesting moment because a lot of times we, we, we tend to think that there's a steady evolution of, of technology, that things just kind of keep evolving right along in a nice, neat, orderly way, and there's no big arguments, there's no big political differences, and, you know, and, and you know, just, you know, just stuff happens. And the ACDC controversy is a moment where there's a, instead of a continuity, there's a discontinuity. There are two rival ways of doing, of delivering electricity, of doing business. Edison had a clear sense that you could actually make electricity, and that was his real point with the incandescent light. You could make an electric lighting business that was going to compete on, on, on a par with gas lighting in cities, and that indeed, it was actually, as time went on, might even be more attractive because, because it's safer, it's less, it's less noxious, a whole number of things. The difficulty is, is this, is, is this Edison's plan for direct current, among other things, would only work in neighborhoods of about a mile in, in radius. So every, every sort of square mile, just to, you know, make, you know, to, to just make this work simply, you'd have to have another power station, okay? And that would mean that it would be very expensive to, to basically light up a city like New York or even a city the size of Hartford in the 1880s. And indeed, the Edison Company actually went through and made a whole series of calculations. They sort of said, right, we, we think that, you know, Hartford will get so many, so many electric lights and Boston will get so many and Portland, Maine will get so many and that, that you know, that's the way it is. So the Westinghouse Company comes along, has developed the alternating, you know, has basically developed alternating current, has decided it's going to go into electric light and power, because that's what, that's what the, the, the Tesla's motor is, was all about, and they were going to get an advantage because they could build on a larger scale. They were, because alternating current, in a nutshell, allows you to build stations that not only serve one square mile, but can serve tens of square miles, okay? And it isn't just magic. I can, I can, you want to do, you, you want to do the equations? I'll do the equations with you, but I'm not going to do that tonight because the poor guy in the back is going to lose, poor kid in the back is going to lose his mind. He's going to say, oh man, I didn't come to your equations. Mom, Dad, take me home. Okay, so, this kid wants the equations. I knew it. Finally did it. Good for you. Okay. All right, but it is essentially, it's a different business model. We're going to build bigger plants, we're going to achieve economies of scale, and it ticked Edison off for a variety of reasons. First reason is, 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 is he didn't think you'd ever make the money back on these large-scale plants. The second reason is, 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 is he didn't think you could actually run, manage a system that big. And, uh, and the third reason, I, I promised you three, two, but you get three for the price of three for the price of two. The third one is, 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 is Westinghouse and the Thompson Houston Company basically sold the systems on credit, which really made Mr. Edison and his sort of Midwestern kind of pay-as-you-go scheme not work out. Okay, so there's a whole set of economic things that are going on here that sets up the ACDC controversy. And then you have this guy, Harold Brown, that shows up, who starts electrocuting animals. Now that part of the story, I'll let, us, I'll let, I'll let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I did the economic part. I did the engineering part. We did not discuss the green room. No, we didn't. We didn't, we didn't, have, we didn't have a clear-cut division of labor. Would you like me to do the animals? Of no, no, Brown? I do have an opinion about Harold Brown. Okay, well, we get you, a little animal. I'll, I'll give you time to. You can throw in your, your your opinion about Harold Brown. I'm actually not sure that I mean, he agrees with this. He's a, he's a, he's a bit 
you know, there's some questionable. All right, so Harold Brown. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, no, I can handle it. Okay. It's your turn. Harold Brown is this, is an engineer who approaches Edison, 1887, 1888, um, with this question of New York. New York State was in the process of. Uh, changing its form of capital punishment. Now, this is where the story kind of gets interesting, and I don't think we have enough time to get into it, but basically, uh, New York State decided that it didn't want to hang convicted criminals anymore. They, didn't want, they wanted to move away from public executions because they were concerned that they were disruptive to social order. Um, keep in mind the labor unrest that Bernie was talking about, the Edison Machine Works in the 1880s. Um, so they wanted to take capital punishment, make it private. They also want it to be quick and efficient and humane. So they appoint a commission to come up with recommendations. One of the recommendations was to use a hypodermic needle. Uh, the doctors said, "There's no way you're gonna, we're gonna let you do that because people will associate hypodermic needles with, you know, executions and death." And that's not going to be good for the health of our patients. So they decide that they're going to, I'm making a long story short, they decide that they're going to uh, try electrocution. Um, so Harold Brown um, and the Edison interests, you know, they get involved in this. Edison is asked by the New York State because he is the leading technical authority in the, 1880, in the 1880s on electrical matters. He has an enormous amount of cultural and, and, and social influence on these issues, and his opinion matters. Um, so Harold Brown um, associates himself with the West Orange Laboratory, and they start doing these animal electrocution experiments in the summer of 1888. We know that they do this because we have the laboratory notebooks, and hopefully this will make you all run out and buy my book. There's a little <laughs> photograph, there's a little illustration of a, of a, from a lab page notebook. Maybe Murray can find it. Uh, okay. Where is the little <laughs> um, So this is a source of, of a lot of animosity even today on the part of the people, the, the people who don't like Edison. You know, with these poor animals. Um, there is a sinister kind of cynical aspect to it, I suppose. But there is also a legitimate question, and that is they don't know in the 1880s a lot about the physiological effects of electricity on living people. And there were a lot of electrical workers who were being electrocuted. So there is this, this need for this knowledge. And um, it's not just this sort of, you know, picture of Edison putting out a black cape, you know, kind of strapping the, the poor poodle to a electro trying it. There's, there's other things at work here. Um, um, other than, the, I, I mean, I, I completely agree with all of that. Harold Brown had a personal vendetta against Westinghouse, and, and, and basically, I think, pushed, you know, took advantage of the Edison company to sort of Settle, settle that vendetta yeah. with Westinghouse because Westinghouse was the was the major the major target of of these of these these efforts and in fact they tried to convince people that when someone was electrocuted they would actually the proper word would be that they were Westinghouse. <laughs> yeah. and it does it, 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 the interesting part is is all of the individuals whether it be like Thompson I wrote about in my first book or, or or Edison or Tesla they all have to deal with this alternating current. Uh, ACDC controversy, and and in the end, the the economies of scale work out, and 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 basically we shift over to alternating current. But this is not to say, as 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 Lenny has as you know, gotten emails and and seen things on on the, on where did, where where was one of your review, one of your Amazon reviews oh, yeah, Amazon. where they said that direct current is 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 what kind of technology? It's a it's a, it's a failed technology. Failed technology. <laughs> well, you know, there are any number of utility companies that are basically sending you know a, a, on the high voltage range when you have the long distance transmission towers that actually use on the order of of you know of seven hundred fifty thousand to one. One million kilovolts. That is often done in DC because it's it's much more efficient, and there are a variety of other advantages to, to doing that. 
Tesla's part on this um, on the AC/DC controversy is 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 is, 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 is he's famous for doing these just demonstrations with his Tesla coil in 1892 and 1893, where he steps onto a, a stage like this and. Um, and he basically would walk up to a Tesla, big Tesla coil, about the same size as he was, and uh, he will have a brass ball in one hand and a light bulb in the other, touch the brass ball to one of the terminals of the, uh, of the Tesla coil, and the electricity will go through him. 250,000 volts, mind you, and the light bulb lights up. Okay, don't try this at home <laughs> under any circumstances. But Tesla did it because Tesla wanted to prove that AC actually was actually safe if you handled it in the proper way, that you had the right frequencies and that you and and you and you know and you took the, the appropriate safeguards. And that's an issue for Edison because he wants you know people to understand that he he, he honestly believed that DC was safer than alternating current. Um, so there's a lot of different things going on there. I, I, a couple other points I want to make is that you know this, this AC DC battle that's like they sort of portray it as like one day there's direct current and then the next day there's alternating current. <laughs> Doesn't work that way. Um, there were large parts of this country that didn't have electricity into the 1930s. You, you, need, a, you need a fresh mic. Right. <laughs> so, this is the I will, express <laughs> back, I will repeat that. There were large parts of this country that even into the 1930s, did not have access to electricity, and that's why the Roosevelt administration um, created, you know, the REA and the TVA and all these other organizations to um, make electricity available to, to rural um, residents. So, you know, the, the, this, the development of the electric power grid in this country it didn't just happen in 1888. Um, even in the 1920s and 1930s, it's, it's still very much an issue. What else? Did, oh, um, the, uh, I wanted to, um, I want to talk about Topsy. Uh, yes. Edison did get not. To the <laughs> contrary to what one prominent media person is claiming, who will go unnamed. Edison did not electrocute that poor elephant Topsy. Um, his company did film the electrocution um, in, in January of 1903. Um, Topsy was um, it's kind of a bad elephant. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they did. Uh, they decided, and it was the Edison Company, the Edison Utility in New York, that provided the means of electrocuting Edison. Now there is some question, some speculation that Edison may have provided some technical advice on that, but there's no proof of that. I haven't seen any proof of that. Um, now the problem with this is that in many accounts, including the recent articles about the aforementioned prominent media person who doesn't like Edison because he electrocuted Topsy, um, he associated that, or the, the writer of this article associated the electrocution of Topsy with the AC-DC controversy. Um, the AC-DC thing was going on in 1887, 88, and 89, and Topsy was electrocuted in January of 1903 when Edison was no longer in the electric light power business. And I think, I would, I would, maybe I'm going on a limb here, but I'd safe to say that that issue had kind of been settled by that point. Oh, I'd agree with that. Yeah, okay. So you see, this is a big thing. It's like, it's almost like, well, we're gonna, we decided we're, we don't like Thomas Edison, so we're just gonna pull out these things and just kind of throw them out there. The ironic thing, and this is the last thing I'll say about the, this whole capital punishment thing, is that Edison actually personally was against capital punishment, and that he he later regarded his whatever involvement he had in this ACDC thing with some embarrassment. Uh, he was not proud of this. He didn't really talk about it all that much, and I think it was one of the things that he probably would have rather forget. I'll ask one more, and it's a related question on, based on this discussion, then we'll open it up to the audience for questions. Um, 
Both of you, in several ways in your books, talk about the historical legacy of these two men, uh, how they are remembered today, if they are remembered today, and in, and in what way. So if you could each just speak to that, you know, how they have become the, the iconic figure that they are today, and reflect back on what originally motivated these men and their work. So I uh, would encourage you all to, uh, if you were patrons of popular culture, obviously you're patrons of high culture when you're at the Mark Twain house and, and enjoying uh, you know, the, the lovely house, the exhibits and all that. But in, in popular culture right now, tune your, set your YouTube uh, video and, and have a look at the uh, Edison Tesla rap video. Okay. Now, and I had the opportunity to, uh, to watch this and then somebody uh, sucked me into uh, giving a talk about it. I thought, well, I guess here goes. So, so here goes. Here's, here's my take on that particular thing. At the end of the video, they sort of said, who won? You know, should you, do you like Edison more than you like Tesla? And my argument is is is, 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 is what the video sets up is, 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 is these two individuals, Edison and Tesla, in, in very black and white stark terms. So on, the, on one side, Edison is represented as the hard-headed, practical businessman, friend of the robber barons, uh, doing deals with J.P. Morgan, and, and electrocuting poor animals. Okay? <laughs> but he's seen as this, this sort of, you know, let's, you know, we're going to get it done, and we're going to get it done for the money. And Tesla is presented as the visionary, as as the humane individual, not too worried about, you know, about his celebrity. He's not worried. He's and he, he has brilliant ideas that he's going to bring and give to humanity. Okay, so you you've got this tension between between us on one hand, in, in you know, in terms of you know. Max Weber, you got you've got bureaucracy and big business over here, and you got with Tesla on the side on the side over here, you have charisma. Now, my take on it is, and it's important, is is this is 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 this in any given society, in any given economy, whether it be the, the the economy of the 1890s when Edison and Tesla are active, or the economy of the 1990s or the 21st century, an economy just depends on getting the right mix of Edison's and Tesla's working maybe not together but working in the same in the same in industries and in the same space. Okay, the computer industry that we have today, without going into the whole the whole long song and dance, depends on a mix of, of the ideas that Steve Jobs and Wozniak came up with and at the same time with individuals like Bill Gates. Okay? And so we when we demonize these guys, when we make one guy the hero, one guy the goat, we lose an awareness of the, of the rich complexity that makes makes innovation possible. And so for me, it's, it's, that's what's important to be thinking about. So I get this on record because I know what you videotape. I will say that I think that Edison and Tesla are both very important. I think that they deserve, both deserve to be studied and, and, and understood. Um, they're going to tell us a lot about you know, the nature of creativity, technological innovation. Um, your question was, you know, about their legacy today, their, their cultural legacy and how we remember them. Um, I mean, I think to a certain extent, Edison has a little bit of an advantage over Tesla because Edison has um, not one, but seven uh, historic sites and museums in the United States that are devoted towards him. Um, you can't argue, we can't argue that Edison is a forgotten figure because I think you go to anybody in the world and you say the name Thomas Edison, they're going to know who you're talking about. Um, the, the light bulb um, will take over their head, and that is another. You know, that's not an accident. <laughs> <laughs> sure can, can do what they want. Um, that the light bulb has become. Um, Sort of the universal symbol for the for the for the great idea, for the bright idea, um, and and that's a testament to Edison's legacy. That's the, that's sort of the good, the positive side of it. Then there's a sort of not so positive side, and that is where Edison is kind of regarded. You know, this is a one we were talking about Tesla, where Tesla is this, you know kind of you know is the future of green energy, you know, um, anti corporate. Edison is seen as definitely, you know, the corporate stooge, the stodgy, old-fashioned inventor. When you picture Edison, you kind of see Edison, the old guy. Um, the Edison that we know, those of us who work in 
West Orange. We know an Edison who's younger, who's dynamic, who's doing disruptive technology. Um, and so part of what I want to do in this book was kind of remind people that, that you know, it was, um, that it could be both. I mean, there, there is definitely the old stodgy Edison. The best example of that is I, I mentioned it in the book, and Fox has not come after me for mentioning this, so I guess it's okay. Um, I was watching this, an episode of The Simpsons, and you have to watch The Simpsons closely because there's all these little sly jokes. <laughs> um, uh, it was the episode a couple years ago where Homer was, uh, he got a, uh, what basically was an iPad, and he was obsessed with it. And Mr. Burns comes in, uh, you know, Homer's at work, and Mr. Burns walks in the room and says, unhand that Edison slate. <laughs> <laughs> what was sly about that was I couldn't tell exactly who the drivers were making fun of. Were they making fun of Mr. Burns or were they making fun of Mr. Edison? Um, but to me it was telling because the fact that you know, the writers of a major cartoon or television show can insert that little reference and not have to worry about people getting it. Um, kind of speaks to you know the power of, of that of, the, of that Edison. Life. Thank you, and we'll now uh, leave the, open the floor for questions. All right. So, like this gentleman, you'll raise your hand, uh, but you'll wait until I get there because they're recording tonight. So you'll make sure you speak into the microphone, and please remember. A question has a question mark at the end of it, <laughs> and it's of a reasonable length. All right. <laughs> There's a difference between a speech and a question. We're asking questions. Okay. This is uh, one question about Tesla, one question about Edison. Uh, Edison is a quick one. Um, there's always numbers thrown around and how many tries it took to make the light bulb. Um, Napoleon Hill always says 10,000, he said he knew them, so I'm guessing that's an accurate figure, but I just want to know the answer. Second question about Tesla, uh, on the History Channel they had a uh, series called uh, The Men Who Built America. I'm not sure if you saw that, but they, uh, you know, this obviously showboard both Edison and Tesla. And in Tesla, they, in case, they said that uh, he pretty much wrote off all, he wrote up all residuals. He just wanted to get his uh, technology out there, and he didn't really benefit financially. And J.P. Morgan kind of in essence, pretty much stole them or got it at a very, very low price. Um, and I want you to talk about that, the, the accuracy of that. I know it's the History Channel, but I still want to hear about that. Okay, so the, the uh, Lenny, how many, how many experiments? The 10,000... We don't know. The, Nobody yeah, knows the, the answer to that. Yeah, the 10,000 comes from a storage battery quote. So. <laughs> and what, what it speaks to just very briefly is this... Is, is, <laughs> idea that you know Edison was working on a problem yeah, like, just, oh, no. sorry that Edison was working on this you know particular problem and he would uh, identify the problem and then test all kinds of different materials um, until he found the one that worked and, and you're referring to his work on finding um, uh, you know the right material for an electric light filament um, and Bernie's right there there was a quote where Edison said he you know he experimented at, Ten thousand different things, um, but nobody really knows for sure. Um, okay, so very quickly, the um, uh, the the television program that on on Fame that involves Morgan, Rockefeller, Ford, Edison, and you know, and tries to create this sort of melodrama that melds all of these together, um, conflates two different things. Okay, the first off is is is, is in in the early. 1890s in order to help Westinghouse hold control of the company, Tesla does tear up the contract that he has with Westinghouse that would have paid him royalties on, on his particular patents. And I think his, his, it, was, it, was, it was loyal, it was noble, but at the same time he also realized that if, you know, if he was going to sell other patents down the road, you know, Westinghouse was going to be a likely customer. So that part is absolutely true. It has nothing to do with Morgan. Okay? <laughs> Morgan is involved in an entirely different deal that has to do with Tesla's plans for wireless power. And Morgan basically loans Tesla $150,000. Morgan asks Tesla, you know, go on ahead and finish structuring the contract to, to, to put the last of the details in. They left actual blank spaces in the contract. And Tesla elected, not necessarily being the smartest, you know, smartest guy when it came to finance stuff, 
to get, assign 51% of his, of his patent rights to Morgan. Mm -hmm. Now that doesn't mean that Morgan ran off with the patent rights, but it later on meant that Tesla was in a bad spot to bring in other investors to the wireless power scheme. But of course, it's assumed that Morgan had this master plan to dastardly you know, squash everything that, that Tesla wanted to do with wireless power. Hi, um, I'm actually a volunteer tour guide at the Edison facility, but uh, I always take tell visitors that uh, both men, like you said, contributed a lot, and both men are quite the geniuses. But there's this narrative, you know, how uh, Tonya Harding and Nancy Kerrigan put figure skating on the map, and, and I think making it a personal feud between them has done a lot to bring the Edison name into focus and given him some recognition, so I'm glad for that, even if it's not really accurate. Um, so the oatmeal versus the Forbes author, you know, there's this uh, blood feud between these two guys, and... Uh, it, it, cross the oatmeal. <laughs> but, but it has allowed them to fund uh, the purchase of uh, Tesla's facility, which is awesome. Um, so, you guys talked about the fact that they barely really knew each other. Um, the, the press, it seems, kind of made it a, a Kerrigan versus Harding thing. And, and I wonder, uh, even though they didn't talk very much, whether they saw themselves as rivals or having a, a personal competition. And what, what truth is there in that, uh, is it apocryphal, that story uh, uh, that Edison said he didn't understand, uh, Tesla didn't understand American humor? Okay. <laughs> right. So, in 1884, Tesla comes to America and, um, and indeed does have a letter, which was not written by Charles Batchelor. It was, it was written by, by one of the Puskas brothers that basically said, and was, it is Tesla's letter of introduction to Edison. And the letter, as, as the story goes, uh, basically, you know, Tesla was supposed to hand the letter to Edison, and the, ed the letter says, Dear Mr. Edison, there are two great men in the world. One is you, and the other one is standing in front of you. <laughs> okay. So for the next eight months or so, you know, kind of mid-summer of 1884 to roughly this time in 1885, Tesla works with the works with the Edison organization and learns a great deal of, of electrical engineering um, technique. He learns how to really design motors and generators and, and how electric light and power systems operate. And in that time, the, the Edison company asks Tesla to develop as kind of a, a backup plan a arc lighting system uh, was a system of lighting that was, was uh, competing with incandescent lighting at that particular time. Um, and the Edison company thought, well, we better have basically a system in our back pocket either for negotiating purposes or that we we're actually going to have to add that to the product line because arc lighting was the best way to, to do street lighting. Uh, at the end of the process, Tesla reports what he's come up with and the company says, well, thanks, but no thanks. Um, and, uh, you know, but Tesla says, but you promised me $50,000 for this. And Edison is reputed to have said, I never found any evidence to this, that, that, you know, well, Tesla, you don't understand our American sense of humor. Okay, now, the, the, we, you have to go then to the next chapter. <laughs> what does Tesla do? Tesla basically quits the Edison company. There's a wonderful notebook in the, in the Serbian archives. Where it belongs, it's basically his Edison uh, Machine Works notebook, and on the last page he goes, "Goodbye, Edison," <laughs> meaning the Edison Machine Works. And he promptly moves from where the Machine Works were in New York City to Rahway, New Jersey, uh, through some uh, connections with uh, people in the Edison organization. Sets up a Tesla Electric Light Company, and guess what they patent and start to manufacture in the next six months? An arc lighting system. <coughs> so I say unto you, my friends. <laughs> Who's, shall we say, borrowing from who? You asked, um, you asked if, that, if, well, I'm going to answer the part of what you asked about, if, do I think that Edison spent a lot of time thinking about Tesla? No, I don't. Um, <laughs> I, that's no offense to, to either one of them. It's just, I think that um, there probably are a lot of other things that are going on in his life around that time that were probably bothering him a lot more. For example, it's falling out with two close friends and business partners, uh, John Tomlinson and Ezra Gilliland, um, 
they had a, a major falling out over a business deal involving the phonograph. Um, that affected Edison in a, in a much more personal way. I mean, Tesla and Edison barely knew each other. Um, so I don't think that he invested a lot of emotional energy in that. And I think that by 1892, 1893, Edison is no longer really involved in the electric power industry. I think that he probably spent a little bit more time, if he stewed at all, he would stew over the fact that they dropped the Edison name off of General Electric. That, pro that probably bothered him a little bit. Um, but I can't imagine that he, that he would, now, he certainly would be aware of, of Tesla and his activities, because he's reading the newspapers, he's reading Scientific American, he's reading engineering magazines and journals. He knows what's going on, but as far as, you know, kind of, like, you know, uh, keeping track of him or anything like that, no, I don't think so. Uh, I was wondering if you might speak uh, about the incompletion of Wardenclyffe Tower and uh, Tesla's later life. Sure. So, Wardenclyffe is where Tesla developed his ideas for wireless power in the period from 1901 to about 1905. And there, uh, Tesla had a, a vision that what he was going to do is, is pump oscillating electric currents into the Earth and that they would then travel uh, efficiently throughout the Earth, uh, taking advantage of stationary waves, and you could basically um, pump the energy into, into the Earth on one hit at Wardenclyffe and basically uh, tap the earth uh, anywhere in the world and as a result have have electric power uh, available for for your use. And similarly, Tesla Fletch might be able to do the same thing with, with messages. Now, um, you know, there's a variety of things that happen. One is is is, is, is uh, Tesla gets $150,000 from J.P. Morgan. Uh, he uses it to turns to his good friend Stanford White, the famous architect, who designs the building that is still standing today um, at, at the Wardcliffe site in Shoreham on Long Island. That's the building that's been rescued by the two million dollars or two million plus that uh, the Oatmeal helped raise uh, in 2010. And um, at the same time, that meant that he spent all the money building the building and getting it right, and he didn't have a whole lot of money, and, and basically Morgan didn't want to loan him any more money. Morgan in part didn't want to loan him any more money because in December of 1901, uh, uh, this, this this Italian punk that always annoyed the living daylights out of Edison. If you want to talk about two people that watched each other and kind of circled around, it was Marconi and Tesla. Okay, <laughs> and they ne ne neither of them really uh, you know trusted each other. Okay, but Mar Marconi successfully sends a message across the Atlantic, and uh, you know um, you know Morgan sort of says, so are we going to get on with this or not? Morgan you know doesn't put any more money in, but also doesn't pull the plug until until 1903. Now, there are many questions about what, what might have happened or not might have happened had, had Morgan given Tesla more money along these lines. Um, but the, the critical part of it is, is, is to think about how the system was actually going to work. My take on it is, is this the following. Is, is, is this is Edison, excuse me, Tesla saw the Earth like a water balloon. He also used a football uh, metaphor, but I, I prefer the water balloon, okay? Now imagine you've got a water balloon, and it's filled up with water, and you've got a little pump on one side, and you pump the little pump, and you pump the little pump at just the right rhythm, the resonance of the balloon, so that the whole balloon is going balloon, balloon, balloon. Okay, and then imagine you have on the other side of the balloon, from the opposite side, get the pump here, over on the opposite side on this side, you've got a little one-way valve. So every time you pump in, if you get this exactly right, get the resonant frequency, water is going to squirt out the other side. That is the essence of Tesla's idea about broadcasting power through the Earth. Okay, now, the physics behind this is, and, the, and, and believe me, there, the physics goes on and on and on and on and on, but in a nutshell, the key part of the physics is, is this Tesla made an assumption that the fluid in the Earth, the, the equivalent of the water in the water balloon, from an excuse me, electromagnetic standpoint, was inelastic. In other words, you kind of push it here, and you push it, and you basically, you know, you get a result over there. In reality, the Earth is like, from an electromagnetic standpoint, like an ocean. Okay, so I grew up on the Jersey Shore. You basically go to the Jersey Shore, and we used to think as kids, if I throw a rock on the, you know, on, on the Atlantic, on the Jersey Shore, will the waves travel all the way to Spain? No, they don't. And they don't because the water 
is an elastic medium and the waves dissipate after a certain point. Okay? From an electromagnetic standpoint, the Earth is like an ocean. It's not like a water wave. And Tesla, when he couldn't quite figure out why that was happening, basically had a very severe nervous breakdown and really was not able to invent after that. So I hope that gives you a, a thumbnail explanation um, as well, but the young guys in the back are probably going to show us what, that it's really about scalar waves. <laughs> I'm going to let these two actually give a, a quick little commercial because they're, they, they have uh, outside interests in, in this conversation this evening. Thank you. Oh, uh, we're the authors of a children's book called Tesla's Attic. Which, oh, uh, excellent. Just I've seen, last month. seen reviews online. Well done. And it's, uh, thank you. And bring copies for me to, to buy and sign? We'll send Or no, you sign. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we bought copies of your books. All right. And then next February? Next February is Edison's Alley. It's a series. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> Oh, hi. Hi. Hello. So, do you remember the old Simpson episode where they all go to a family therapist and zap each other so much that they explode the power grid and turn off the lights in the whole city? <laughs> First question. Second one is, do you think that Tesla and Edison, being that it is now 2014, would roll over in their graves if they still saw, if they saw the holes and all the wires and cables still hanging outdoors <laughs> for hot and you know lighting up everybody's house. Yeah, I, 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 that's an interesting question. I, yesterday I was um, reading an interview that Edison, a syndicated interview that Edison gave for a reporter in 1921, where he basically is talking about how complicated life is, and he thinks in the next 50 years everything's just going to fall apart. Nothing seems to work. It's like it was this totally pessimistic interview, and it, it, I stopped to read it. I mean, I, I see a lot of stuff in my work, and I don't often look at it, um, because I don't really have the time. And we have six, six and a half million pages of stuff, so you don't really have the time to look at everything. But that struck me as, like, that's not typical of the kind of thing that you're seeing, Edison, where it's usually this optimistic, rah-rah stuff. Um, part of what he was talking about is, like, he was, he's basically talking about political gridlock. And he was saying, you know, Congress, part of the problem was that they, people, political leaders don't think. That's what he kept referring to. People don't, you know, uh, the people don't take the time or the labor to think anymore. And that's, and, and, and Congress, is, you know, they're, that's why things are breaking down. Um, that's a modern complaint. I mean, that, that could be in the paper today. Um, so it's an interesting question what they would think. I mean, I suppose on the one hand, they'd probably be excited about all the possibilities. You imagine what they can do with all the tools that they have and information that they have available, the internet, computers. But they'd also look at and say, well, you know, look at all the problems that you, that you guys still are facing, and, and you still have that political gridlock. <laughs> Do you want to take a stab at that? No, no, I want to go to the next question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, another Simpsons thing is uh, Homer uh, had an episode where he admired Thomas Edison. Then uh, that, and that was a really good one. That's one of my favorites. Uh, the, the name of the episode is the uh, the Wizard of Evergreen Terrace, which is the street that they live on. There, anyway, there is a, just a comment on that. We we suspect that there was one or more of the writers that have actually been to the park in the West Orange. <laughs> just a little bit too much that was familiar in that episode. Um, well, they go to the, they go to the, uh, the, the museum, uh, one of the museums uh, in the episode. Exactly, and it's, it, is, it is, you know, they, they obviously knew what they, were, what they were writing about. Okay, real question. Um, I need to hear this trick. Okay. Um, could you, uh, Talk more about their their childhoods uh, a little more. That, sure. that doesn't really uh, get covered, and it's always interesting to know how uh, you know uh, how people are uh, you know the formative years. Well, yeah, well, most biographies of Edison don't really spend a lot of time on the childhood, primarily because there isn't a lot of original or primary information that survived. Edison wasn't famous when he you know was born and grew up, so and you know. Grew up in the Midwest. He was one of a, of a, a, a number of children in this in this family in Ohio that, that moved to Michigan when he was seven years old. 
Um, the, the things to rem remember about Edison's background is that um, he, and this is an amazing thing about his story, is that he doesn't come from money. He doesn't come from a family that has land or a lot of influence. Um, they're not poor by any means, but they're certainly not wealthy. He also does have, he has very little formal education, um, probably less than a year. Uh, the old myth is that uh, he was uh, kicked out of school because you know, they used to say he well, thought he was addled. Um, or he asked too many questions. Um, he was too curious. He wasn't. He didn't fit in with the, the kind of rote learning that was prevalent in the, you know, antebellum America. Um, it is more than likely that, you know, the lack of family resources was a factor in him not getting as much schooling as he did. And it wouldn't have mattered because boys at that point were, one, they were expected to learn basic reading and writing and arithmetic, and then they were supposed to go out and work and help support the family. And that's basically what Edison did. So. To finish, you know, the point, his education as an innovator begins when he gets a job um, as a candy butcher on the Grand Trunk Railroad, which runs between Port Huron and Detroit. Um, you start to see his first entrepreneurial trades. He starts selling, um, you know, fruits, vegetables, and things, uh, newspapers uh, along the. Uh, the route that he took every day. Um, he's also taught telegraphy, and that gives him an entree into, you know, basically the you know the, the cutting edge technology, communication technology of the late 19th century. That's how he gets his start. So Tesla comes from um, his, his his family is Serbian. He grows up in what is today Croatia, but at that point was the southern edge of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. It was uh, called the Krajina, which meant that it was the Austrian military frontier. And so one of the key things out of Tesla's background is, 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 is he's, he grows up in a very complex ethnic environment, and you are very careful about people who are not from your background or from your family. And I think this is one of the reasons why later in life in New York City, he doesn't have, as far as I can tell, a whole lot of friends and a whole lot of kind of public interaction because he's constantly kind of worried about who's friend and who's foe. Uh, so that's one thing that comes out of his background. Um, I mentioned a little bit that he's, he's strongly influenced. He's not deeply religious, but the discussions about how to think about the world, how to, how to, how to, how to make sense of ideas, is, is influenced by his father being a Serbian Orthodox priest in the Serbian Orthodox Church. His uncles were as well. And I think that his notion of seeking out this ideal, this underlying principle, grows out of his out of his uh, out of his religious out of his religious background. His uh, relationship with his parents is is complex. Um, in fact, the very opening line of his 1919 autobiography uh, could have been taken from the uh, Smothers Brothers in the 19, 1970s, where he's, he basically he says, and I'm paraphrasing here. Mom and Dad always liked my brother Daniel better than they liked me. Okay. So he's writing this. In, he's born in 1856. I'm not going to try to do the math on the fly here. In 1919, he's in his 60s, um, almost 70, and he's still troubled by by this this, fam this complex family dynamic that's that's set up between his his dead you know that his dead brother. There are high expectations for his dead brother and. And uh, you know they sort of thought, well, Nicola will sort of live up to our expectations, but he doesn't. Uh, he has a he has a very difficult relationship. Not as near as I can tell. I have a difficult relationship with his father um, in, in college. He basically takes up smoking and gambling and domino playing. I didn't know domino playing was so dangerous. But <laughs> it was. You know, eat it in the cafe when you were smoking and drinking coffee. Um, and uh, his father sort of tries to you know sort of get him to reform his ways. And, and basically, Tesla says, no, and uh, I won't. I won't change my ways. And, um, and his father goes home and, and basically, well, his father goes home and make a long story short, Tesla is brought back a few weeks later. Um, he's basically kicked out of, uh, out of this particular town. Um, and uh, he's brought back, brought home, sent home by the police. He's been arrested. Um, it's, he's been arrested supposedly for being a, being a vagrant, which doesn't seem to have been the case. But it broke his father's heart. His father dies. 
and uh, and Tesla then has to kind of figure out how to, he's going to deal with these these obsessions, this 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 problem that he had with gambling, which he, he ultimately overcame. He also was, uh, and I, I uh, hadn't made this connection, but he probably shared this 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 passion with Mark Twain, uh, having seen the billiard room in the in the house here. Is is this is, uh, Tesla was an outstanding billiard player, and in fact paid for a certain amount of his kind of costs in going to engineering school by uh, by basically. Playing, playing billiards and gambling. And so in fact, when he got to the Edison organization, uh, he never told anybody that he was a master billiard player. And I think he, I think he fleeced more than one. one <laughs> but that's, a, that's, those are a few snippets of his, of his childhood. It's, uh, I completely agree that, um, you know, that much of, of, the, of what you do as a biographer is to try to really understand essence portions of the childhood in order to set the stage for how the how the rest of the individual's life unfolds. Okay. Thank you. Uh, this is a, a Tesla question and um, I also saw the History Channel um, show and what I remembered was uh, Tesla was born during a lightning storm. You might have mentioned that but I found that interesting. But I want to talk about uh, two things. The first, love and romance. Um, he was a good-looking guy. He hung around with some... Exactly. We found him very attractive. Um, he dressed nicely, had a lot of cool, famous friends. And um, he did not seem to uh, hook up with anyone. And the, the show that we watched made a very interesting statement that almost like he did something to himself so he wouldn't be bothered with with such things. So I'd like you to expand on that. And um, my second question is at the end of the show there was like a, a fleeting mention about his involvement or visionary around uh, harp and weather control. And in light of uh, if anyone's noticed the weather experiment that's going on right now, um, I'd like you to talk about that. Okay, so um, you, you, you're, you're the center part of your question, which is is what I, I'll, I'll try to deal with, you know, primarily is is his is his relationships and um, and whether you know the, the whole question that. Uh, newspaper reporters loved to ask in the 1890s is this is why Tesla had not married and, and would he ever marry and indeed one reporter in about 1896 manages to corner Tesla one night uh, you know and and ask Tesla actually ask Tesla this and he says he says it's fine for writers and poets and other uh, creative people to get married because they they the, basically the woman can be the muse in their life they can be the inspiration but he says, you know, an inventor has such a wild, an intense and wild nature that, that, that you know, that indeed marriage would get in the way of the sort of work that he was doing. So that's, that's one explanation that Tesla offers. Um, I think a more likely explanation is, is this is that Tesla was gay, okay? Um, and that there is evidence uh, that I found uh, that he had probably two significant, he had first, he had no, with the exception of Ann Morgan, okay, um, who uh, it turns out is, is, is later is, 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 is a lesbian, uh, he had no significant female, well he had, Kath, he had Catherine Johnson was a significant female friend. Uh, I, previous biographers have I've basically kind of gone, you know, gone to great extremes about the Tesla and, and, and Catherine Johnson, which I, 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 I don't buy. I think Tesla had two significant boyfriends in his, in his lifetime. One was Anthony Segetti, who he, he met in Budapest. In fact, he was the individual that helped Tesla uh, recover from uh, an, er an early mental breakdown, uh, got him out, got him out walking, uh, got him sufficiently inspired, and uh, indeed, they were walking uh, side by side in, in the park in Budapest when Tesla has this vision for the electric motor. Uh, Zagetti just sort of conveniently drops out from the story after World War I because it wasn't politically fashionable to talk about um, somebody having somebody being gay. Uh, the second one is, 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 is he had a significant relationship with uh, Richmond P. Hobson, who was a naval war hero, um, and indeed uh, it, that was one of the things that also contributed to Tesla's big breakdown in 1905, which is, 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 is that Hobson decided that he was going to marry uh, uh, Griselda, that was the, the girlfriend's name, 
um, in order to be able to run for Congress. And, and the, the congressman, he, had to, he, he thought he had to be presentable, and Hobson felt that he had to be married. So, so I, I, you know, the short answer is, is this is Tesla, uh, my, my interpretation is, is this that Tesla is gay. Um, now, about the weather modification stuff, all of these things, it turns out, a lot of these things, like the Philadelphia experiment, the weather modification, did Tesla have a time machine, all <laughs> go back to this, it, which is it's, it's like this one moment. I, it, it amazes me that how much leverage you can, in the, in the kind of myth business you can get about it, which is, is, is Tesla gets, gets basically gets electric, not surprisingly, gets electrocuted periodically in his laboratory. <laughs> Instead of seeing stars, he basically at one point sort of said, he said, you know, it seems, you know, when it hit, you know, when it got zapped, he said it's like time stood still. And so people have run with that one little quote and sort of corrected all of these, these complicated ideas about things that he, various things that he wanted to do. Um, and, and he certainly, uh, you know, had, had wonderful ideas about, you know, that, that humans were going to be able to use radio waves to do all sorts of things, like control the weather, but he had no, no specific plan for doing that. So I hope I've covered, you know, we, uh, there is a nice story, but I've saved, I'll save the story. You can ask me later about what the midwife said when the lightning bolt struck. <laughs> <laughs> I just broke. All right. Last question, so it might have to be about the midwife. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is, this is probably a little bit dangerous to ask right now, but it, it, uh, it's going to expand a little bit on what you're talking about, I think. Microphone with your mouth, please. Because, um, um, I just uh, I want to talk about like the uh, involvement of magic in the whole uh, beginning of electricity because really it was kind of an amazing thing at the time and I think both of them kind of used uh, magic as a way to sell their their inventions. Absolutely. So I, I don't know, you know, what Lenny, let them want to run with this for a few moments. Okay. So I spent a lot of time because, you know, needless to say, there are any number of passages where Tesla is, is referred to as, as a magician. Okay. Um, and, and, and so I, I wrestled with that. Indeed, uh, my big insight about the, I, the notion that, that he would have a great idea, but he couldn't necessarily get it across to people directly. Um, but instead he would tell you a story or do a demonstration or you have a fabulous photograph. I really worked out what that was all about in, in reading about Houdini. And Houdini always emphasized that what he was is, is and Houdini went after, you know, um, uh, um, clairvoyance. And, and people had basically said, oh, well, you can get in touch with ghosts and you can do this and that. And he really wanted, and Houdini really wanted to prove those people were wrong. The Houdini's ma mastery was that he was an illusionist. He get you, so, as he often he, he says at one point in his, in his, in his memoirs, Houdini says, my job was to get you so worked up that you would be absolutely convinced that I was going to drown or, or something bad was going to happen to me when I was all chained up, like with, you know, chained up and, you know, milk in the milk can, the milk can put in the bottom of a tank of water. Okay, and you know he said, but every night, for seven nights a week, I get out of it. <laughs> <laughs> but he captured he, he, Houdini handled the theatrics so that you really believe that that was happening. Now, people that do <coughs> electrical experiments before Tesla, before Edison, in the mid in the mid nineteenth century, even back into the seventeen eighties and seventeen nineties. Uh, would often go and they would do a series of, of electrical experiments, demonstrations, and, and wow the audience. They, they'd come to Hartford and, you know, you'd go to the Athenaeum and there would be a scientific, you know, an ostensibly scientific lecture and they would show you various experiments. And, and the whole point was, was to wow the audience, was to create this illusion that something amazing was happening. And indeed, for 19th century people in a world of mechanics where, you know, power went from point A to point B, because you had you had connecting rods, or you had pulleys, or you had gears, or you had belts. The fact that you know that you know you do something over here, and you know you know you basically you set up a Tesla coil over here, and you have a light bulb over here, and the light bulb starts lighting up. That sure looks like magic to me. Okay, so Tesla is 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 definitely understands that to advance a new technology, you have to indeed deal with these sorts of illusions. And as you probably know, Arthur C. Clarke's famous line, the, the great science fiction author, he says, 
any sufficiently advanced technology will always look like magic in its first version. I don't have the quote exactly right, but it's in the book. So, you want to talk about wizards? Yeah, wizards. I mean, there's, you know, that plays right into that. There's, a, there's this famous uh, newspaper part. Sorry. <laughs> I'm so excited to talk to everybody. Um, there's this famous cartoon from the Menlo Park period where Edison is portrayed as this wizard um, in the wizard's hat, hat. And that kind of ties into this, you know, this idea that he's you know, working with very mysterious forces that, you know, for telegraphers, people in the telegraph industry, they, they, you know, they were used to dealing with electricity. That was something that they understood or at least we're familiar with. For most people, they're not familiar with, with electrical technology. So it was new, it was exciting, it was mysterious. Um, Edison definitely does play into that. Um, it's gonna, and also, it plays a role, along with Tesla and Bell and other uh, inventors and engineers and business leaders, introducing these new technologies that begins to make it hard for people to know where the boundaries are where, between you know, real and unreal. Um, best example of that would be, you know, the people who saw motion pictures for the first time. A train coming at them, and, and people were frightened, actually literally, literally frightened that there was this real, you know, real, real threat coming at them. Um, with all these, these new media that are coming in and, and becoming available, it's becoming a lot harder for people to distinguish between what was fake and what was real. Um, and Edison and Tesla definitely do kind of take advantage of that and, 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 and use that to sort of promote what they were doing. Um, before we say goodnight to our speakers, I just want to do a, a few quick commercials. Um, if you didn't get one on the way in or you didn't get one in your mailbox, uh, the Spring is Swinging brochure includes all of our upcoming events. Um, especially next week on Tuesday night, we have an author here named Andrew Carroll who has a new book out called Here Is Where, and it's about forgetting those or, or remembering those historic sites that have not uh, been memorialized in any way. And he goes on this cross country journey to try and visit sites of historic significance that have not. Um, not been marked in any way. Uh, the following night, we have an author, first-time novelist, Connecticut native. Uh, the book is called The Land of Steady Habits. I think those of you who are nutmeggers have heard that term before. Uh, and it's about a man going through a midlife crisis in his uh, Fairfield commuter town, commuter line town. Um, it's a really interesting book. Thursday night, uh, we have the author and illustrator of a condensed, easy to read, funny version of the Bible called God is Disappointed in You. <laughs> <laughs> and on Friday night, uh, we have actually two things going on. We have author Reza Aslan, who wrote the book Zealot. Um, it's a biography of Jesus Christ. Uh, and got a, a uh, big and un unlikely start on Fox News when the reporter kept asking, you know, why on earth is a Muslim allowed to write a biography of Jesus? Uh, so he uh, defended himself vigorously, and the book has gone on to become a bestseller. And we're also kicking off our new Servants Tour Beck and Call on uh, Friday night. So you can get information about all that except for Reza Aslan, which kind of fell out of the sky. Thank you, Jesus. Um, <laughs> Uh, after this went to publish. Uh, so um, you can get information on all those things, um, and you can also get information at our uh, front desk about becoming a member. A lot of you um, come to events regularly here. It would be nice if you were able to uh, become a member of the museum, and if you do, you can get a discount on such wonderful things as a book by W. Bernard Carlson, <laughs> Tesla, uh, or by Leonard de Graff, Edison. Thank you. Uh, um, do we want to have, is, is there a particular uh, uh, relative of Edison in the house we might want to acknowledge? Uh, sure, we'd like to introduce <laughs> David Edison Sloan, who is uh, related to Edison's daughter, Matt. Uh, great, is it, um, I don't think it was great grandson. Great grandson. Great grandson, great -grandson of Thomas Edison. <laughs> Amazing Mark Twain scholar and a former board member and trustee here at the museum. So thank you very much for your support. Um, round of applause, please, for Craig Hotchkiss, our moderator. Bernie <laughs> Carlson, our Tesla. And Lane 
Thank you very much. The Books for Water Store. Uh, thank you all for coming tonight and for supporting the Mark Twain House and Museum. Hopefully, we'll see you at one or more events next week. Thank you.